the director of the newest edition of Denver's Cultural Arts District, Dean Sobel, brings a notable career as a specialist in 20th century art to showcase an exclusive and permanent museum of one of our most important painters. Clifford Still is credited with laying the groundwork for abstract impressionism. And even though he was considered the most anti-traditional of that movement, marked by abstract expressionist forms, expressive brushwork, monumental scale, still use these elements to convey themes about the human condition, creation, life, struggle, death. The story to be told by Dean is one of intrigue, an entire estate of work over 30 years being sealed off from public and scholarly view, specific conditions of release, a deal made, an exclusive display in a single museum of nearly 94% of a life's work of a master. It takes an expert to spearhead over 60 exhibitions of international contemporary art, and most importantly, to host Denver's own jewel, the Clifford Still Museum. Please welcome its director, Mr. Dean Sobel. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to move very quickly because I have a lot of information I want to convey. And this is my remote, I bet. One second. Get familiar with it. Uh, so I think the first thing I want to say is uh, you shouldn't feel bad if you don't know the name Clifford Still or if this artist isn't as known, well known to you as many other 20th century artists. Because as my remarks will hopefully reveal, um, Clifford Still probably did everything in his power to make sure you didn't know who he was. Uh, but let me see if I can get that to advance. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Let me try. The arrow, right? Is the thing on at all? Hold on, sorry. Oh, there it is. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so what I'll do is start with some, bas some basic biographical information, um, talk a little bit more about his paintings uh, and drawings themselves, and then we'll end with the reason uh, this collection ended up in the city of Denver. Uh, but Clifford Still was born in North Dakota in 1904, and his life really spans the entire 20th century, kind of the greatest century um, for artistic production. Um, his family moved to eastern Washington State near Spokane, where uh, they would become farmers and also homesteaders of land in Alberta, Canada. I think if there's anything we know, Still did not want to follow in his father's footsteps of being a farmer. And at around the age of 15, he got a box of paints and essentially taught himself how to paint. Um, his earliest mature works, I would call them, were all made in Alberta, Canada, like this picture. Uh, this is a painting from around 1927, so he's only about 24 years old. And it's, uh, to me, it's somewhat surprising how um, abstract this image is to many people. It's a train coming through the prairies um, where it's being uh, dwarfed by that vertical yellow grain elevator. And then very interestingly, and we'll soon learn characteristically, um, this line of smoke is rising up from uh, the, the train. And there's something about this picture in terms of its coloration. Can, can you dim the lights a little bit more? I'm not much to look at in the slides or probably, I don't know if that's hard. It's not, the paintings will sort of pop a little better. Um, but the uh, coloration, I think his interest in reduction, um, look at how abstracted that landscape is. Thank you, that's perfect. And if you uh, come to the museum where this painting is almost always on view, you will sense in the brushwork of the sky in particular, this, uh, this sense of energy and hidden forces that exist in nature. And that's a theme and a topic I want to return to a, a few times. Um, somewhat um, inexplicably, still around 1934, essentially becomes a figurative artist. He makes portraits and portrait groups of farm workers and family members in a very expressionistic and dour style. Um, look at the hands of the central figure, for example, uh, which are red from blood, uh, using their hands to um, work in the fields. And look at how the uh, facial features have become almost skull-like and the eyes are sightless. Um, we're obviously in the midst of the Depression and although still by this point has a master's degree and is teaching at Washington State, he very uh, clearly understands the trials and tribulations of not only being a farmer, but being a farmer during the Depression. 
Um, the image on the right by Clifford Still, I think, is another masterwork from around 1935. You wouldn't see it in this slide, but also there's blood dripping down these, uh, these uh, emaciated figures' arms. I show it against an image from the mid-19th century that may be familiar to you, the so-called Gleaners. And I think there's something in Still's work that is in constant dialogue with the history of art. He would have been aware of this earlier image, um, not the least of which is because it was such a popular image during the Depression, the idea that hard work uh, will get you a higher place in heaven. And I think in Clifford Still's image on the right, he sees it much differently. The hard work is uh, taking a physical and probably mental toll on the people at that time. Um, it's a pastel drawing on the right that I want to compare with other Depression-era artists. This is the well-known Grant Wood uh, painting from 1930 called American Gothic. And I get this sense that he would have, uh, and many of us would have known of Grant Wood's painting in 1930. It was on the cover of Life magazine. It was uh, kind of emblematic, again, of America at that time. And I think, like the previous set, Clifford Still's looking at these images and, and, and correcting what he sees as being a more real condition for farmers than that somewhat lighthearted, even humorous expression that we see in the Grant Wood painting. Um, by the later 1930s, uh, the picture on the left is 1937. His style is advancing very, very rapidly. Uh, the picture on your left, yeah, uh, where we still see a farm worker. Uh, it's a male figure uh, clutching onto now probably abstracted farm implements and farm machinery. But the way he renders the figure, the human figure now, gets very, very interesting. Um, there's a little blue hook you may detect on that figure's uh, uh, chest or breast, which is probably all that's left of the farmer's clothes, the coveralls. But in, uh, in uh, every other way, the clothing has been removed, and perhaps more remarkably, the skin has been removed uh, conceptually to show the inside of this person. We see suggestions of rib cages uh, and even bones and fragments of the body that are now being revealed to us, I think further suggesting that Still's interested in not the physical appearance of things uh, in his world, but trying to get inside these farmers and trying to understand um, you know, sort of what, what uh, keeps them alive and what motivates them. The image on the right side is even more abstracted from 1938. Those three red dots uh, seem to be sprocket holes that attach to additional farm machinery. Um, there's something in this work that still seems uh, uh, figural. The blue form on the right, although no longer human, I think is now a surrogate for that farmer. And anything that we tend to see rising vertically in Clifford Still's art many times is uh, a, a symbol, a stand-in, if you will, for the people that he used to describe more representationally. Um, the image on the left is a uh, Clifford Still from around 19, in the early 1940s, increasingly abstracted. The uh, disc, uh, orange red disc at the lower left is probably sun or moon, but they uh, become, again, less embodied in a, in a specific landscape. The yellow vertical striations could be wheat, uh, could be the sense of heat rising up from the landscape. And then that amazing figure, I'll call it, um, that is shrieking at the top of the composition. Um, again, they're no longer uh, human in this way. They feel almost amphibian or, or reptilian. Um, but I compare it to a Picasso in the middle of the three and a uh, European sculptor by the name of Giacometti on the right to show you that as wonderful and as distinctive as Clifford Still's art is um, by around 1940, it's certainly like most American artists' work owes something to the inventions of those European masters, modern masters, who really captured the attention and probably invented modern art before the Second World War, but things will change very dramatically uh, for the United States in painting and sculpture uh, during and after the war. Uh, believe it or not, this is a Clifford Still painting from 1944. Uh, it's uh, a kind of image in the history of art that I think almost has no precedent. And you have to, again, put yourself into the uh, eyes of people making paintings in uh, America in the 1940s. But it is uh, monumental scale, probably seven feet tall, about five and a half feet wide. The imagery, I will call it, consists of a very expressive falling black line at which the yellow and another form seem to have attached themselves to the top. Um, the surface of the black paint that you see here intentionally shot with a raking light gives you a sense of how expressive and tactile his surfaces are too. Um, there's something about this work that seems to be trying to communicate something, but I wouldn't want to reduce it to communicating one thing. Remember 1944, 
we're right at the end of the war, and I think all of these artists' work that uh, still is associated with, and I'll touch on these in a minute, are very interested in creating works that have uh, narrative and content and subject matter and meaning, but they're trying to communicate it in an abstract way or through abstract images. Um, here's another Clifford Still from 1945 that, again, I think shows you how advanced his art has become. And now when I compare that image to the er, image from the earlier 40s, this really tells us the difference between work that was somewhat um, being derived from European modern precedents and what happens uh, around 1945 and the end of the Second World War where these American artists really take hold of the art world and create what is, in fact, a completely new method of making paintings. Um, this is Clifford Still in 1946, a picture that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, where I think it all comes together for him. His sense of color, the way he applies it, by this point it's always with palette knives and trowels. He's no longer using brushes. Um, the way in which paint itself can be a communicator of feeling. Um, and then perhaps the most challenging point I want to make about this image, and I don't think I have a pointer on this. Oh, I may. Um, is that I still sense and I still detect this idea of figuration. The black vertical snaking form on the left, not unlike that snaking smoke that was coming up from the, uh, the train I saw you in the first slide, seems to be in dialogue with another snaking golden and white form on the right. Um, Clifford still acknowledged um, verticality in his work. Um, Clifford still saw verticality as symbolic of, of, of a life force. He even called those white uh, or those lines that run vertically life lines. The idea that horizontality represents death. When we die, we go horizontal. But things grow and we stand proud, marching vertically through the world. So there's a whole syntax that still is developing in his art. And I would just challenge you to, uh, to look at this image and not assume it is as abstract as you may have first thought. What's important in terms of Clifford Still versus his contemporaries is Still is much more advanced at this time. Um, Still is primarily on the West Coast until around 1950, and his New York-based colleagues, this is Jackson Pollock on the left, if you know that work, and I'll show it again, or Mark Rothko on the right, are still making images that are rather Picassoid, I would describe them, but also rather representational. You get a sense of figuration in the left, um, uh, landscape in the right, and Still is really quite out front. A, a painter by the name of Robert Motherwell said of all of us, Still was the most original, a bolt out of the blue when he came to New York in 1950. Most of us were working through figures and Still had none. And I think that's really what is so um, significant about Still in terms of the development of American art. Um, here's another example of some of his contemporaries, um, Adolf Gottlieb on the right and Willem de Kooning, uh, I'm sorry, on the left and Willem de Kooning on the right to give you an example of how advanced Still's work was at this time. Um, in the late 1940s, he's actually based in San Francisco where he's teaching at what's now the San Francisco Art Institute, but he's sending paintings to New York for important exhibitions. Uh, this is his first one-man show in New York in 1946 at a gallery run by Peggy Guggenheim, uh, and this is an installation view of that exhibition. Uh, here's an installation view of a later exhibition in the 40s that show his sort of completely abstract work at this time. Um, but it's really during this period, although based in San Francisco, that his life starts to intersect with these other uh, American avant-garde artists. And I thought this would be a good time to just try to uh, describe quickly what I mean when we talk about abstract expressionism. Um, I'll take the word expressionism first. Uh, expressionism is an age-old tradition. The piece of Gothic sculpture on the, uh, on the left suggests that this artist, uh, Woodcarver, was very interested in distorting anatomy. Um, the head of the Virgin Mary holding this Christ who has just come off the cross is much larger than uh, what you would normally expect for her body. Or the proportions of the figure of Christ are again distorted and elongated for an expressive end. Um, when you take the Edvard Munch painting, the famous scream from around 1900, the artist has distorted everything. Color, perspective, anatomy, um, nothing is really as the world exists in, in reality, but it's how these artists are freely distorting uh, imagery and technique as a means to convey feelings either about something in their own minds or something external in, in the world. 
Um, abstraction, now, abstract art really was a 20th century invention. Although um, when invented mostly by the Europeans in the teens during the time of the First World War, it was usually easel scale. So, you know, paintings that are the size of most paintings. And uh, mostly hard-edged geometric forms. It wasn't loose like the American artist would do. Um, and it's really the uh, introduction of what we even think of a 19th century romantic ideal that I think is inserted into not only Clifford Still's work, but in uh, the other abstract expressionists as well. So this image on the left, which is from the 19th century after a battle in an ice field, um, is a very expressive image about the forces of man and nature colliding together. And I would suggest to you that the Clifford Still on the right, although not directly inspired by the image on the left, is honestly about some of those same things, the forces of nature and how we can give visual form to them. Or more difficult is this um, comparison I'll try to make with this image on the left of a man scaling a top of a mountain and being exalted by the uh, presence of nature. We've all done this when we've climbed to the top of a 14er in Colorado or sat at the base of the, or at the rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, and I would challenge you the, to suggest that the painter on the right is interested in some of the same ideas. Um, the vertical lines that intersect that field of red are intended by the artist to signify some kind of presence and probably a human presence. And the infinite red field of paint, very abstract, very, um, very severe abstraction in this case, is uh, meant to symbolize the universe. So in fact, these are artists who are interested in the same idea, how man fits into the infiniteness of, of time and space, but they're using different artistic languages to describe that. Um, the idea of a primitive form starts to emerge into the abstract expressionists as well. Here's that Jackson Pollock again, which some of you may have detected um, looked rather primitivistic. There's swords and figures, something like what might appear on a cave wall. Or the sculpture on the right by David Smith looks like something that would be at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, but is in fact a, the work of a, a mid-20th century American artist. Um, or these images, too, all seem to derive from various uh, uh, classic or ancient traditions. Um, the image in the right is by the woman, uh, female sculptor Louise Bourgeois that looks exceptionally totemic. Or on the right, Adolf Gottlieb again, where you detect fish and heads and certain shapes that we recognize. But uh, in, in the lower left corner of that image on the right, you see these simple geometric shapes and signs and markings that, like in primitive art, we may not understand the imagery in a totem pole or a Native American headdress, but we know they have meaning. And I think that's why the American artists were drawn to uh, so-called primitive art, is that it allowed abstract signs and symbols to be holders of meaning and subject matter. So the other abstract expressionist, just to give you a whirlwind <laughs> tour through that, um, would, would be Jackson Pollock and his poured and drip paintings. Uh, Willem de Kooning, both figures and uh, landscapes, quasi-landscapes. Franz Klein, these big, bold, this is almost the kind of quintessential abstract expressionist painting. It's probably about that size in real life, too. These very masculine sculptural black uh, forms. Or Ma Robert Motherwell, well represented in the Denver Art Museum uh, collection. These kind of swollen, throbbing black forms as well. Uh, Mark Rothko represents that more, what we might call tonal or transcendental, a kind of softer expressionistic abstraction, um, which one critic uh, uh, said they appear as if the colors had been breathed onto the canvas. Or back to the Barnett Newman again, although very different in terms of the severity of the um, geometries in his paintings, are very much about and have many of the same qualities of abstract expressionist art. Uh, and Adolf Gottlieb now as if those, those uh, orbs at the top are being born out of all that chaos of the paint at the bottom. Um, and so this Clifford Still now from around 1957, I will use quickly as a, de uh, as a definition of what we mean by abstract expressionism. First of all, scale. These were artists in the post-war period that wanted to make uh, paintings the size of the great history paintings in Europe. So this painting is 9 by 13 feet, kind of a common proportion for Clifford Still's art, but very unusual for painters to be working in um, in the mid-century. Um, the tactile nature of that yellow and black and little highlight colors, there's something about those uh, 
torn paper-like forms that are just innately expressive. If you were to see this picture in person, um, you would see that the fields of paint are again plied with palette knives and trowels, and just that physicality of the paint gives another layer of expressionism as well. Um, but what's probably even more unique about these pictures is that there's no central subject matter. There's no portrait figure, there's no still life element, and our eyes are essentially moving about the canvas looking for a place to rest, and they never seem to rest. And Clifford Stills art too, it seems as though the forms would go on beyond the parameters of the stretcher, a kind of infiniteness of these images. And you start to realize that the central subject of the painting is the painting itself. It's one image and not a, uh, a composition of, of uh, you know, attending images. Uh, so this is Clifford Still in the 1950s. Some of these paintings are actually on view right now where he um, settles into his signature forms. Uh, here's another one from around 1957, and if you note that yellow passage on the right, it's to my point that he tries to activate every square inch of the canvas. Um, this picture, which we actually isn't on view right now, one very much like it, you would even see areas of bare canvas. The idea of pauses and things not being painted could be expressive as well as the painted areas. Um, a couple things that Clifford still said about his art that I think are very important. Um, the quote I mentioned about verticality I think is very key. But more uh, perhaps puzzling to first time viewers, behind all my work lies the figure. What does he mean when we look at this admittedly baffling painting to some of you? And it's the idea of figuration, the idea of things running vertically, the idea of um, energy forces and even implied movement that you sense in these images. And then more importantly, he doesn't want an art for art's sake. Um, he wants his, his uh, color and his shapes and his texture to fuse into a living spirit. And that's what's so different about this abstraction from both European abstraction before the abstract expressionists, but also um, later American abstract art, is that they wanted it to embody meaning, the human condition, all the things um, that uh, are embodied in just being alive. Um, so when I show you this image from 1937 and compare it with an image uh, 10 years later, the coloration, even the scale in this work is roughly the same. And even the profiles of that farmer seem to be mimicked in that red snaking line on the right. Um, so it's not so much that his um, ideas change or even his subjects change, it's how he chooses to represent them. Or in this sequence of images, you start to see what I hope could be obvious figuration, male and female, maybe a little bit more confused figuration in those bony like rib type forms, and then the image that I showed you um, earlier in my talk. Um, in uh, 1961, well actually let me go before that, in 1951, uh, still writes his art gallery owner uh, saying he's withdrawing his work from public exhibition. After moving to New York in the early 50s, he realizes that the art world is uh, a political, corrupt, and a, a place that he doesn't want anything to do with. Um, so he essentially drops out of the art world and starts to manage his own career, basically stockpiling his art. In 1961, he moves to Maryland with his second wife, um, where he basically paints in, in seclusion. That's him between the barn and the, uh, the main house. His barn was being used as his studio. His paintings in the Maryland period are somewhat more ethereal, a slightly lighter touch, if you will, more areas of bare canvas, as if things are evaporating off the surface. Here's another one that is on view right now at the museum, although not looking so good in this slide. I'm going to skip past that. Uh, in the last year of his life, he has a major exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum, 1979-80. Uh, it tells you how high his star was at that time uh, because American artists rarely, or living artists, were rarely given exhibitions at that prestigious museum. Um, when he dies, his will reveals that everything he had in his possession, which we now know to be 3,000 artworks, 95% of everything he made, 825 paintings, a little over 2,000 drawings, and his complete archives would be given to an American city who would agree to take care of it, show it, and uh, make it available for study. Uh, during the period after his death, the abstract expressionists became very famous. They were selling for tens of millions of dollars. Jackson Pollock had an Academy Award winning movie made about him. And those artists became as well known and as highly esteemed as Pollock and, or as Picasso and Matisse. Um, Mrs. Still made the decision to lock up his entire estate after his death so nobody saw it 
um, even scholars until Denver got involved in the project, which does a lot to damage your reputation. Um, in 2003 and 4, then Mayor Hickenlooper uh, visits Mrs. Still, now in her 80s, and convinces her that Denver would be the uh, ideal place for the Clifford Still Museum. And as many of you know, our governor is a pretty persuasive guy. Um, the museum hires me. The 501c3 nonprofit is, uh, is established. I'm hired to direct the project. We purchased a parcel of land right next to the Denver Art Museum so that they can provide all the context for Clifford Stills Art. Uh, we uh, had a, uh, hired an architect and began uh, uh, unrolling these paintings. Most of them were rolled on tubes, and so we had to, uh, in order to see them, we had to unroll them. This is in the warehouse in Maryland. Uh, masking tape it fixed to the surface. Uh, we demolished the building in 2009. Uh, and then I'll skip to the, the building itself. Uh, but we hired an architect who basically created a vessel, something that would be the holder of these artworks. Um, and the approach was a very expressive cast-in-place concrete form in uh, a simple two-story arrangement. Um, on the main floor, all the support functions, storage, research centers, offices, restrooms, ticketing, um, and then all the galleries are uh, uh, put to the top floor where we can take advantage of daylight. And hopefully you've been by the museum, if not in it. Um, the galleries have varying proportions. This is some of the lower ceiling, about 12-foot ceiling height galleries for the smaller, uh, more figurative art. And then by the fourth or fifth gallery, the ceiling basically opens up to let in skylights. And if any of you have been to the museum during the daytime, I think that's the real um, thing people take away is that quality of light and how it not only transforms the paintings, but also transforms the way you feel, not being in an artificial lit environment. Uh, smaller galleries, again, for the drawings and sculpture. Some of the works from the 1950s. And that's it. And I think right on my 25 minutes. <laughs> that's not easy. Sorry to rush through that so quickly. I know some of us are going over to the museum now where we'll actually look at the paintings in person. But I would encourage you to come to the museum. We just opened up a new exhibition that combines the paintings and the drawings to reveal uh, Clifford Still's process. So thank you for your time and attention.